Welcome back, everybody. Now that you know about meiosis and its stages and what it is used for, I wanted to develop some further ideas about meiosis. So let's get started. First thing, let's figure out where meiosis occurs in the animal body. Since its goal is to produce gametes, it occurs in the gonadal tissue, in the ovaries and testes, and it occurs at sexual maturity when gamete formation is actively needed. What other cells are produced by meiosis, you might ask? Well, that's a trick question, right? None. Gametes are the only types of human cells produced by meiosis rather than mitosis. And many students wonder what happens to cells that are produced by meiosis. They all either mature into gametes or they die. So what is fertilization? Fertilization occurs when two different kinds of gametes, sperm and egg, fuse. That restores the diploid condition and it creates what's known as a zygote. And that's a vocabulary word you need to know. By what process does the zygote develop, you might wonder. Well, that's a mitotic process. The zygote develops into an adult by mitosis, by cell division. This leads us to the idea of the life cycle. And the life cycle is the generation to generation sequence of stages in the reproductive history of an organism. For sexual organisms, here's how the life cycle might look. We have fertilization to form a zygote, and then that single cell by cell division here, abbreviated as mitosis, develops into a mature individual. And then in the gonads, meiosis produces gametes, and then fertilization occurs and the cycle begins anew. Here's a picture and you can spend some time looking at this picture and seeing how you have sexually mature organisms producing gametes, the gametes fuse at fertilization, and then we have a mitotic sequence until they're sexually mature again. Now, I wanna to talk to you about several ideas that have to do with promoting variation in the genome. The first comes out of the idea that when the homologous pairs of chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate of meiosis 1, in other words, in metaphase 1, they do so randomly. And this is called independent assortment because the maternal and paternal homologs are randomly placed into daughter cells and independently of the other pairs. This means that for chromosome 1, the mother's chromosome might go to one side and the father's to the other. But for chromosome 2, the maternal and paternal chromosomes go is entirely random and not related to where they went in the first pair. The number of combinations possible when chromosomes are sorted independently is given by the formula 2 to the n, where n is the haploid number. So for humans, it's 2 to the 23, which is more than 8 million. So there are 8 million different possible combinations of chromosomes that all humans can produce in their gametes. And here's a diagram that shows that to you, uh, and you should take some time to look at it, but notice that in this case, the maternal chromosomes are on one side and the paternal on the other, and here one maternal is on one side and one paternal is on the other, and vice versa. And it gives four different combinations of chromosomes in the daughter cells. The formula is 2 to the n. In this case, haploid number is 2, so 2 to the 2 is 4, and you can see the four combinations. I'll leave you to study that on your own. Variation, you may remember, is the key to evolution, and particularly genetic variation. And why is that? Because without genetic variation, selection cannot cause change over time. Natural selection results in the accumulation of genetic variations that are favored by the environment. And sexual selection results in the accumulation of genetic variations favored by the choosier sex. But unless those variations are genetic, there can be no cumulative change in the population. So sexual reproduction actually increases the genetic variation in a population. So let's look at how. Mutations are the original source, the ultimate source of genetic variation as the sequence of nucleotides in a gene changes, the proteins and RNAs that are produced function slightly differently. And those that are actually beneficial will get selected for in the long run. 
So sexual reproduction increases variation through three different mechanisms. One is the independent assortment we just talked about. Second is crossing over. Crossing over produces individuals with unique combinations of genes on chromosomes, and therefore it increases genetic variation. And the third is the fact that sperm and egg are equally likely to be fertilized by each other when they're produced. So there are no favored sperm or no favored eggs. So let's take a look at some of these things in detail. Crossing over produces what we call recombinant chromosomes, which combine genes inherited from each parent of the individual producing the gametes. Crossing over begins in early prophase one, when the homologous pairs line up gene by gene in that process called synapsis, and homologous portions of the two non-sister chromatids trade places. So crossing over contributes to genetic variation by combining DNA from the two grandparents of the gamete, so to speak, into a single chromosome. Humans have about one to three crossing over events per chromosome pair, per meiotic event. So let's look at that. Here are the replicated chromosomes. Here we see we have crossing over occurring. And here now are the recombinant chromosomes. You can see two didn't recombine, but two in this case did recombine. There were two crossing over events here, one on each tip. And here's a micrograph of crossing over in case you want to see what we can actually see. Now, random fertilization further adds to genetic variation because any sperm can fuse with any egg. The fusion of gametes produces a zygote with any of about 64 trillion diploid combinations in humans. Crossing over adds even more variation. Therefore, each zygote has a unique genetic identity. So, what is the purpose of all this genetic variation? It's clear that sexual reproduction creates more variable offspring. So why would this evolve? Sexual reproduction seems to be a bet hedging strategy. It maximizes the chance of offspring contributing to future generations, but minimizes the chance of a really big payoff. Well, what do I mean by that? When the environment changes, some of the new combinations may be more favored and therefore survive. And since the environment is constantly changing, sexual reproduction puts out a suite of offspring, some of which will survive. If the environment doesn't change and there's an individual who's very well adapted to that environment, then asexual reproduction might be the best strategy. But when the environment's changing, sexual reproduction is selected for because some of those offspring are favored. And if we look at the history of evolution, it seems to be true that sexual lineages survive longer than asexual lineages. The last topic I want to cover today is called non-disjunction. Sometimes during meiosis, the chromosomes do not separate correctly during anaphase. And instead of the chromosomes moving to one side or another, you have two move to one side and none move to the other. As a result, 50% of the gametes in this case would have an extra copy of a single chromosome and 50% would lack one chromosome. There are two ways for this to happen, as I'll explain in the next slide. First is in meiosis one, and the second is in meiosis two. Should one of these gametes with an extra chromosome or missing a chromosome happen to cause fertilization, then the zygote will either have three of one chromosome, a condition we call trisomy, or only one copy of one chromosome, a condition we call monosomy. So before we go on and talk about that, let's look at how non-disjunction can happen. When the chromosomes are pulled apart, that is called disjunction. They are disjoining. So if they don't pull apart, it's called non-disjunction or non-disjoining. So here is an example where in meiosis one, you get non-disjunction of the homologous chromosomes. As a result, one daughter cell gets a single chromosome and the other daughter cell gets three chromosomes. That means the gametes here, two of them will have three chromosomes and one of them will have only one. If these fertilize an egg, these will give the offspring three of one chromosome, 
and these will give the offspring one of one chromosome. Another way for non-disjunction to happen would be in meiosis too if the sister chromatids didn't pull apart correctly. So that would happen like this. You would then end up with one gamete with three chromosomes and one gamete with one. So those are the two ways that non-disjunction can occur. So at this point, you might be wondering, what is the effect of non-disjunction when those gametes create a zygote? In most cases, zygotes that are formed from gametes that have undergone non-disjunction fail to develop. In other words, the condition is lethal. There are only a few kinds of trisomy and one kind of monosomies that are born in human beings. All others cause spontaneous abortion. The first and most common one that you will have heard of is trisomy 21, which is known as Down syndrome. You could also have three of chromosome 18. That causes a condition called Edwards syndrome. You could have three of chromosome 13. That causes Patau's syndrome. All the other survivable trisomies and the only monosophy all have to do with the sex chromosome. So let's look at them. An individual with two X's and a Y has Klinefelter syndrome. An individual with three X's has trisomy X. An individual with two Y's and an X has Jacobs syndrome. And then the only survivable monosomy is Turner syndrome, where a female has a single X chromosome. We will spend more time looking at these conditions that arise from non-disjunction in a later class this year. So that's it for today. What I hope you have learned is where meiosis occurs, what its goal is, how sexual reproduction increases the variation in offspring and therefore seems to have been selected because it increases the chance that the offspring will survive in a changing environment. And we've also covered today non-disjunction and the medical conditions that can occur when a non-disjoined gamete forms a zygote. Until next time, go outside, look at nature, ask biological questions, bring them back to class, and I'll see you soon.